that I actually wrote out what I wanted to say because keynote speaker <laughs> is always a little intimidating to me. Um, and I love the words of Wendell Berry because it, I thought so much about how to talk about leadership. I don't want to talk about it in the abstract. I want to talk about it in the singular from my own experience. And hopefully in relating my experience, you'll glean a little bit of wisdom from me because that's what a keynote speaker does, is words of wisdom. And uh, I just, my whole thinking about this was encapsulated by the sign that we saw driving up the uh, driveway here, slow down, <laughs> and enjoy the view. <laughs> and that's something I've always had a really hard time doing. Um, I just left public office after 21 years. I started uh, in 1993 on the Santa Rosa Planning Commission. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what inspired me to do that. Um, but I was put on the Planning Commission by a very unsuspecting city council <laughs> to replace none other than Rick Tice. <laughs> and uh, back in 1993, Rick was the outspoken progressive in City Hall. And uh, to say the least, he was not particularly welcome. And the things that he had to say were not particularly, uh, didn't real, people didn't really want to hear it. But back in 1993, the Santa Rosa City Council had agreed to a secret subsidy of the development of the market site that's now down on Santa Rosa Avenue. And uh, Rick didn't think that subsidy should be particularly <coughs> secret, so he blew the whistle and he started talking about it in public. That did not endear him to the city council. I knew none of this, by the way. At, in 1993, I was a young lawyer, raising my three young children. I lived on Manzanita Avenue in Santa Rosa, which is this beautiful wooded area, olive trees, fir trees, redwood trees. Uh, and at the time, they were starting to develop or discuss developing uh, Fountain Grove Parkway as a four-lane expressway, basically a freeway, and it would cut off the end of Manzanita Avenue. So I was reading all this in the local newspaper, and getting pretty darn alarmed. And I'm the one that doesn't like to just sit around and complain, so I thought, okay, I hear they want some planning commission applicants. <laughs> I'm going to go down there and talk. Uh, I knew a couple of developers and a couple of uh, real estate people and a couple of business people from my law practice, so I called them all up and said, hey, I want to do this. At that point, I was basically a blank slate as far as politics was concerned, and um, went through the interview process, and this is my second time around, by the way. And because they so much wanted to get rid of her ties. <laughs> 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 never know. <laughs> you just never know. And I look back on my 21 years in public office and I found all these times that I just never knew. I didn't know what I was getting into. I didn't know that Rick and I were going to end up to be the best of friends and the greatest and strongest of allies. I didn't know that I was going to be carrying on his work and his message, as well as the work and the message of my great friend Patricia Wiggins, who's now deceased. I didn't know, I just didn't know, nor did anybody else. Um, so I went, I got appointed to the Planning Commission in 1993, started going to my, my meetings and reading all my stuff and learning, and I one that just doesn't open her mouth until I've observed what's going around me and what the dynamics saw. But I'm a lawyer, and I'm a litigation attorney, and what I do is I ask questions. And I didn't realize that asking questions is a very dangerous thing. That <laughs> <laughs> is very challenging to people. I was just asking questions out of curiosity. And I wanted to know certain things. And I started to find out that people around me were getting very defensive when I would ask these questions. And then I started trying to understand, well, why are they so defensive? Who is protecting what? And the more I started to question, and the more I started to find out, the more aligned I really became at whose interests were really being represented at City Hall in San Rosa. Now remember, things are very different now. In 1993, there were no progressives, or very few progressives, or actually people who would not identify themselves as progressives on the City Council at the time. And we didn't even really think of ourselves as progressives back then, or environmentalists. Um, it, it just wasn't as defined as it is now. But I began to realize that it really wasn't the interests of the people that were being represented. It was the interests of developers and business people who are part of the community. But I believe in a balance. 
And so those of us who considered ourselves progressive, we didn't really have a voice. So I started to speak out a little bit more. And of course, that was not uh, well received. But I found out that members of the community were listening. And members of the community were paying attention. And they felt that I was bringing a new, fresh voice to the Planning Commission. And so a group of them approached me and asked me to work for City Council in 1996. I remember I had young children at home. So that day, I went home and I had dinner, uh, prepared dinner, which I always did, all the way up until my kids graduated from high school. Um, and I, we all sat down, we had family dinner, and we always talked about our day. And my ex-husband said, well, how was your day? And I laughed and said, you'll never believe this. Some people asked me to run for city council. And all three of my children are looking at me, and he says, well, what did you say? And I said, well, I said no. And my oldest daughter said, hi. That really took me back to why. You know, I had to break down my assumptions. And my assumption was I couldn't be a mother of children and, and run for office at the same time. So I re examined that and ultimately, obviously, said yes. And in 1996, it was when the UGBs were first on the ballot in Santa Rosa. That was my platform. The UGBs and the redevelopment of downtown Santa Rosa, the revitalization of downtown Santa Rosa, bringing a train. Santa County and um, restoring Santa Rosa Creek. That was my platform. And my political advisor said, I'll never forget this, oh, nobody wants to hear about a train. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody cares about downtown Santa Rosa. <laughs> so all these years later, um, I feel a little bit vindicated. <laughs>
where environmentalists find it difficult to move an agenda forward alone, and labor finds it difficult to move an agenda alone, alone. And we don't all have things in common necessarily all the time, but we have enough in common that we all need to work together. And we know that we have common adversaries. So we've developed this alliance, and I think it served us well, because 13 years later, 15 years later, we've adopted progressive uh, majorities in almost every city council throughout the county, and potentially on the board of supervisors. Um, some of those majorities have been short-lived, but at least they're there. <laughs> and I've learned that progress is two steps forward, one step backward. And when we take that one step backward, it's a time to regroup, to rest, and recharge, and go back out and do it again. And that's how we managed to get things moving along. So, um, in 2004, my good friend who was then in the assembly, Pat Wiggins, uh, was forced out by term limits. And Again, she came and asked me to run, and I said no. Many of you remember, for a long time I said no. <laughs> Until finally one day I said yes. <laughs> finally, yes, okay, let's do it. And again, it was my children that made me do that. They asked me, Mom, why are you saying no? And I started to think, well, maybe, you know, I need to be a, uh, I'm a woman of a certain age, by the way. I remember when women were not supposed to run for public office, we were not supposed to be not lawyers, we weren't supposed to speak, and we now have to speak. In fact, I was told I couldn't be a lawyer because I'd take a job away from a man who had a supreme skin. <laughs> so I remember those days. <laughs> so my thinking was, well, maybe I need to be a leader to provide an example for my daughters. And the thing that really clinched it was I thought to myself after that, Maybe I need to be a woman leader to give an example to my son, <laughs> which was equally important. And so I decided to say yes. Um, and here's a, here's a little tidbit that we just never know. Just a few months before my uh, election to the state assembly, I was arguing my first case in front of the um, California Supreme Court. And I was terrified. I was so frightened and nervous. My voice shook and cracked, and I could barely get the words out. And I was standing at a podium like this, and one of the courtroom staffers took pity on me and brought me this tiny little cup of water filled in the room. And my hands were shaking so hard I couldn't drink it. <laughs> <laughs> but so during all this, the Chief Justice, who was then Ronald George, Chief Justice, was sitting there. He was the timekeeper. He was reading his mail. I'll never forget that. I wasn't paying attention to me at all. I was reading his mail. And here I am trying to, you know, advocate for my client who's reading his mail. Cuts me off in mid-sentence. And his energy comes up. Um, and I lost the case, by the way. <laughs> uh, I hate to say, but I did. Um, so not more than four months later, I'm in my assembly office. We're talking about the budget. And in comes Chief Justice Ron George, asking for more money. <laughs> it just never <laughs> So I told him my experience with him. <laughs> and we had a good laugh. <laughs> and because I am a lawyer and I believe in the administration of justice and how important the judiciary is to a free and functioning democracy, uh, I promised to help him. And we became the closest of allies again. <laughs> and in a situation where you just never know. And ultimately, you heard, I'm the first and only woman to be awarded the Stanley Moss Defender of Justice Award. And that's, that's
that I was appointed chair of the Assembly Budget Committee and the Joint Legislative Committee on Budget. And so it was up to me, basically, to act and to speak on behalf of the entire legislature, both the Assembly and the Senate, and to push back on behalf of the Democrats and our agenda against the Republican Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. I had no idea what I was getting into again. Um, but I have eight years of experience with uh, municipal budgets on the San Diego City Council. I've always served on the budget committee. And I've been on the budget committee in the State Assembly for four years at that point. And my belief is a budget is not a bean county document. It isn't the bottom line that counts in that budget. A budget is a moral document. Mm -hmm. It is inherently moral. It represents your values. It represents where you are willing to put your money. And so I didn't believe that my only job was to balance the state budget. I believe my job was to balance the state budget and to mitigate and minimize the impacts on the most vulnerable Californians. Well, the Schwarzenegger administration didn't quite see it that way. This was a crisis, and in crisis there is opportunity. And I happen to have been leading at this very moment, Naomi, Naomi Klein's The Shock Doctor. Mm -hmm. Seriously, literally reading it as these events were transpiring. And I started seeing, maybe I was a little paranoid from reading it, but I started seeing what the Schwarzenegger administration was doing. They were trying to close down parks so they could privatize them and ultimately sell them. They were trying to shut down programs such as food stamps, which the federal government primarily funds in the state. They were trying to shut, they, they actually proposed shutting down all health care for young um, children, for low-income children, just eliminating them. They eliminated programs that provided breast care, um, breast cancer screening programs for um, low and moderate-income women, mostly Latinas, by the way. Everything they wanted to do was to basically yank out the democratic fundamentals of the state of California. Um, they, I could go on and on. I actually kept, I wrote a blog, by the way. <clears throat> if you're ever interested in what happened back then, I need to write a book based on my blog. Yeah. It's at lorienevans.blogspot.com. Uh, it's pretty horrifying when I go back and I reread what we were actually being called on to do. Schwarzenegger had, um, he created a uh, panel that looked at income tax and, and the way that California revenues are collected. And what they came back and proposed was basically a flat tax which is horrendously regressive and would fall hardest and heaviest on low-income Californians. So it was my job to push back against all that. And Schwarzenegger is a pretty powerful man. Um, I'm no fan, by the way. I'm even less of a fan than I was back then. But um, pretty powerful. And I didn't have a whole lot of tools at my disposal. So the one thing I did that I think really turned the tide was I brought people into the Capitol and I held public hearings. Not from local government. Public hearings is what we did. They don't do public hearings in the Capitol. <laughs> we have hearings, but I wouldn't call them public in the way that the general public comes up and talks about the issues before you. So I did that. I held two weeks of back-to-back -back daily hearings. There was even a um, photograph, an infamous photograph of me on the Los Angeles the front page of the Los Angeles Times and the Fold, sitting there in my chair with my eyes closed because I was holding back the tears when a young woman who was HIV positive came and said that we were cutting out the program that provided her life-saving drugs and she didn't know how much longer she'd have to live. Um, that's the kinds of stories that we heard. And that went on for weeks, day after day after day. Literally hundreds of people coming and telling us their personal stories. And the upshot of it was, we didn't get everything we wanted, but Schwarzenegger sure didn't get everything he wanted. Yeah.
work with a Democratic governor, and I'm glad I did that. Um, and I'm glad I did in retrospect for another reason. Um, again, that, that economic crisis had long-lived results. And California, it wasn't long before California was on the forefront of the foreclosure crisis. And in the legislature, every year, somebody tried to carry a bill that would give homeowners some amount of rights in the foreclosure process. Because California has a non-judicial foreclosure process. That means nobody is looking at the papers that get filed. Nobody oversees this entire process. The banks come in, take your home. They're signing documents fraudulently. Uh, they're signing, having people sign documents where they know absolutely nothing. There's questions about whether or not the chain of title is accurately um, pro uh, passed because of this entity, this private entity called MERS, the Mortgage Electronic Registration System. Uh, they're bypassing our counties with respect to registration of documents. Whole whole host of problems that you know many years from now could raise their ugly heads and create an enormous number of problems for people. Plus, people are losing their homes. So um, in 2012, I believe it was, um, the two houses of the legislature decided to form a joint committee on the home on the foreclosure crisis. And at that time, the Senate was considering appointing somebody who was basically in the pocket of the banks. He was then the chair of the Banking and Finance Committee, which I ended up taking over a little later, by the way. Um, anyway, so they were going to appoint him. And we knew he had come out really <coughs> in the beginning and said, I do not support allowing homeowners to sue the banks. It's off the table. And I said, well, wait a minute here. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. That's the only way we can enforce this. So we kind of battled it out with Daryl Steinberg, and Daryl, to his credit, appointed me as the chair. And so again, I shown the sunlight on this whole process. We brought people in, homeowners, to tell us their stories. And I remember clearly the bank lobbyists would sit in the front row, and these homeowners would come in and testify. And I'd be listening to these people, and we'd be crying, they'd be crying, they would not. <laughs> <laughs> After all these hearings and with the work of Attorney General Kamala Harris behind us, um, we ended up adopting the Homeowners Bill of Rights. It's the first piece of legislation of its kind in the entire United States. It allows homeowners finally the right to sue the banks if they do it wrong. It's very limited, but it's the only tool we've ever been able to adopt for homeowners. And when I get discouraged about the influence of money in the capital, and I do that often, I remember the Homeowners Bill of Rights because it was hand-in-hand combed out with the five largest financial institutions in the world. And the people won. Show up, speak up. It's all I've ever done. It's all you'll ever need to do. And so 
Thank you very much. Before I was called up to speak, um, this is kind of a watershed year for me. My uh, youngest child just graduated from college, so I no longer have kids in college. Yay! Um, <laughs> I've left public service after 21 years. Legislators don't have a pension, so I don't get to say I'm retired. Um, I. Uh, uh, turned 60 this year, which seems like a big event in my life. And I'm really just kind of waiting for the next adventure to reveal itself. Um, I joined the board at Green Belt Alliance, which I'm really excited about. Yay, Jake. Um, so, I don't know. <laughs> I'm waiting to find out. I know I enjoy practicing law, but I also know that that's not something that satisfies my soul particularly. Um, uh, Noreen did not talk about it. You just never know. I wish I retired in modest soul. As the, the courage that she has always shown. Yeah. And you can figure that out listening to these grand tales. I haven't read your blog. I'm going to go back and read it now and encourage you to become an don't, author. Don't read it before you go to bed. It'll keep you awake. <laughs> but I just wanted to say one thing. Um, I was lucky enough in the early part of my political career when we were both on councils uh, to fight some of the good fights with Noreen. When she went to Sacramento, somewhat, re somewhat removed, not that we weren't still friends, not that I didn't try to stop by when I was in Sacramento, but if you track what she said about being prepared, being ready for the unexpected, and speaking up, and then you add courage. <laughs> so I'm going to say one more thing and then I'm going to leave on that note. Um, courage is a funny thing. Courage is not the absence of fear. <laughs> and, uh, you know, everything I talked about, everything I did, I did it with great trepidation and fear. Courage is the desire to get beyond that fear and the willingness to get beyond that fear. Uh, courage is, is finding yourself in a situation and just doing your best. And, you know, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. That's all it is. I don't particularly think of myself as courageous, but um, I do think that it's important to do your best. Show up, speak up, and get away. I mean, why not? What do we have to lose, right? <laughs> Thank you.